Hello, my name is Robert Mitchell, and today in this podcast for Electro Pages, I am joined by a special guest, Scott Miller from Cinch. Cinch, nice to meet you, by the way. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks so, for having me. So the first thing I want to do before we jump into the questions about the products and solutions that you offer, um, tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, and why you do it. Well, I am the Director of Product Management for Cinch Connectivity Solutions. We're a division of Bell. Uh, and uh, we make interconnect products. Uh, mm. Our focus is in the harsh environment uh, space, many markets, and I'll get into that in a moment. But I've been doing, I've been working for in the interconnect space for about 28 years now. Mm. And uh, most of it been in product marketing, product management, product marketing. Um, I've been uh, with manufacturers specifically uh, and um, really enjoy, uh, I really enjoy the markets we serve. The products we have are very cool, uh, but the markets that we serve are even cooler. Yes, and I actually have some questions about that later um, when it comes to uh, military uh, applications, but I'll save that for later. Um, but my first question uh, to you actually is, and I saw a phrase in, in one of the sheets you gave us, and I believe it's pronounced uh, SWAP, but S-W-A-P, yeah. what on earth is that? SWAP, it's an acronym that uh, has been bounced around for a while now. And it basically stands for size, weight, and power. Oh, okay. And I like to, and not to try to be an innovator here, but I like to, I like to say it's evolved to swaps, which mm. we would be size, weight, and power, and speed, mm. because speed is so critical, and how fast you transmit your signals and so on and so forth. So, and so size and weight, it's all about reducing size and weight to the electronic components of the world, yeah. and connectors fall in that world. Uh, and increasing the power, increasing the density of product, but while still mm -hmm. condensing the, the package. And speed is all about increasing the speeds of things and how we can transmit signals quicker. Fantastic. Um, now, you said that your cable solutions are used in harsh environments. Could you give us an idea what these environments and applications would be? I think some of the coolest thing, or the, the, the best way to envision it is when you're on an aircraft mm -hmm. and you're, you're flying, like I just flew over here from the U.S. Same, same. Uh, and uh, as you sit in the seat, or as you walk into the airplane and you look in the cockpit, you see all sorts of instrumentation, right? All of that is, there's behind those are boxes, boxes mm. of electronics, little computers all over the place. All of that has to be connected yeah. and sent to other parts of the aircraft to communicate back and forth between the cockpit and the landing gear cockpit and the wing flaps cockpit and the engine cockpit and everything else. And as you're sitting in your seat, the fuselage is literally surrounded 360 degrees from front to back of wire, mm. copper wire, and connecting all of that, or and that has to be connected. And so that's where connectors come into play. So we actually are one of the biggest suppliers to one of the largest aircraft manufacturers in the world uh, for connectors. I didn't know planes used copper wire. I thought they used aluminium to reduce weight. Uh, well, that's one of the ways that people do it, but aluminum uh, wires is, is connectable as well. Hmm. So uh, one particular aircraft manufacturer has been moving, evolving into aluminum wire. Hmm. Another one is still in the copper world, hmm. but regardless, they both use the same connectors. And, and what advantage would uh, copper give you over aluminum in a cable? Uh, I think just the traditional. The, it's just such a legacy, right? And it's well, it's well established. It's the tested. first. It's the first thing we we use to conduct electricity. Yeah. is copper. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of uh, applications as well, I take it you also work in the defense sector. Yes. Now, I've had quite a few conversations with people in the past about this, and I always find it absolutely fascinating. Um, do you develop solutions for munitions? Like we do. Like. Like shells. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So I want to know, tell me everything about that <laughs> and the problems and the challenges you face when working this. Because I think it's a really, I think it's an, an overlooked an, or it's, I think it's underappreciated just the sheer G forces involved from firing a shell to it yeah. spinning around. So give us a bit of details about that and the challenges that people face. Well, and also one of the biggest things is the telemetry of it mm. and controlling uh, something like that, like a missile. Um, and so within a, within a missile, and it can be a dumb bomb or it can be a smart technology bomb uh, mm. or missile, and those are self-guided or guided by somebody else or like instrumentation. Exactly. Yeah. JDAM's a dumb bomb yeah. uh, with some, some uh, 
heat-seeking capabilities, right? Mm. Uh, but when you get to a Patriot missile, mm. when you get to a Javelin missile, you get to those type of, well, Javelin's a little bit smaller, but you get to the, some yeah. of those type of missiles, and those are very precise, extremely precise. Mm. And you have a ton of electronics running up and down that missile, um, and you need to connect one into the other. Uh, for instance, in the Pac-3 Patriot missile program, and I'm not divulging any information that's not uh, in the public eye, <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's there's something called the safe module, and it's used to, if the missile were to go off course, yep. you need to be able to to terminate that mission, yep. so to speak. And the safe module has a lot of connectors on it, yep. and there's a lot of very high critical connectors on there. Mm. Uh, and if I'm answering your question yet, uh, but that's the type of product that you'll see in a munitions uh, type market or those type of applications is there's a lot of electronics that are connecting the different parts of the missile and things like that. And, and what kind of solutions do you, do you use to try and make cables survive high G environments when they're being shot out of cannons and stuff? Well, you can think about the probably the, the highest one is missiles or one of the highest ones is missiles, but we're also on space. Hmm. So when that rocket launches, um, you know, the capsule or the hmm. other parts of it that are sending satellites up, um, that's a ton of force. And really, it's uh, it comes down to you how your the mechanisms of which your way you're connecting. Like I mentioned, we ha we're on the aircraft, so aircrafts take off and land, and there's some very uh, not necessarily high vibration per se, but there's heavy shock when the plane lands, when the plane hits turbulence, all those things. Uh, but when things take off, to your point, um, you need to have a robust coupling mechanism. So mm. when you're mating that plug to that receptacle, when you're taking the cable and you're connecting it to the box, yeah. You have to have a very, you know, uh, robust system, and mm. it's a lot of different, um, uh, you know, intellectual properties gone into developing that technology over the years. But it's also been around for about seventy years, and it's just kind of evolved from yeah. there to get it better and better. Um, interesting. You mentioned about uh, missile termination, um, which is obviously critical in a situation like that. And I can actually think of one example where that I think it may have gone wrong, which was, you know, you know, Elon Musk's um, Starship when he launched it mm -hmm. and they, they, they tried to terminate it. I think it took a whole minute 30 before it actually decided to, to, to terminate itself in that. I wonder, I wonder if in that situation, something like a dodgy cable could have caused issues when it was going up and they could, they lost control of the situation. They right. couldn't, they couldn't terminate the rocket. Right. Um, and, and, and so that's where redundancy is built in, but exactly. Uh, yeah. But, 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 well, oh, oh, well, were there redundancies built in that situation? I don't know because it wasn't yeah. responding. So, yeah. and, and so, like you say, that if, that if that thing came down on public space, it would be utterly devastating. So, you need reliable connectors exactly. to make sure the data gets through. So, you know, things go wrong, you can always terminate the system. Could you tell us about your MD80 connector uh, that you've? I think you're bringing out now. Is it? Yeah, we've had this uh, drive in the marketplace that we talked about early uh, on a swap, right? So, size, weight, reducing things, and speed. reduce. And speed. And, and power and speed, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we've had interconnect pro products for many, many years, yep. and things are getting smaller, or the need to get things smaller is, is continues. Yep. And as that copper wire or that aluminum wire uh, is able to get smaller and smaller and transmit more mm. through those lines, then you can hopefully the connector will follow. Yes. And so we've developed over the uh, past several years is what we've had circular connectors all of our life. Cinch has been around for over 100 years. And circular connectors in the harsh environment has been around for 75 or 80 years. And so we've been supplying that type of product, but now we're getting to the point where we really have to shrink the package for to meet the customer demand. Did you say you've been around for 100 years? 105. 105 years? Yeah. So when was that? 19... 17. 1917? 1917 or 1918. And your first products were connectors? No. Our first products, actually, I don't know the... Push button curtain fasteners for Ford and Chevrolet. It's for automobiles. Wow, how brilliant. That's incredible. And our sister company, Bell, mm. was one of the first people to develop fuses for RCA televisions oh, in the 1940s, Bell, and yes, 50s, yes. 1940s and 50s. Yes, I That was their first product to market. But anyways, mm. so as this interconnect uh, evolution, if you will, over many, many decades, um, for some smaller, lighter, more density, higher density, more power, mm. better signal, better speeds. Uh, we've developed our micro circular product. Mm. And this is basically connecting the outside to the inside. And basically what that means is you got your cable side. Uh, let's talk about the aircraft again. Mm. And you're connecting from the landing gear to the cockpit. Yeah. 
and you want smaller and lighter air, uh, connectors that can do the same thing, that meet the same performance requirements as all those past connectors did that were much bigger, and they're just in a smaller package, and that's what you're looking for, so you can save on weight, as you know. Every say, pound on an aircraft absolutely. saves you and, tons of fuel. And like you say, you, you imagine how many cables there are. Yeah. Every single cable needs two connectors, because it's going to two different places, yep. and I don't think you want to permanently solder anything, so it's, everything's going to be connector connector. Yep. So if you've got like a, I don't know, how, how many wires, how many cables do you think there could be in a craft? Typical? They say that like a Boeing or an Airbus uh, heavy, uh, or wide body, as they call it, um, there's miles. 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 How, how about how about like the number of cables as opposed to the length? I don't know the numbers. Let's, let's, but I can tell you there's like several hundred connectors. Several hundred connectors. Several hundred. And and, and if each each one's weighing, I don't know, two hundred grams. How, how much how much how much is a connector typical connector? Well, it's again the size the, the size the size is gonna drive that. But they're in yeah. ounces. Uh they're you know, half an ounce, quarter of an ounce. But it, but it adds up. An ounce. Oh, gosh, yeah. and the wire is even heavier, mm, you know, absolutely. than the connectors are because you've got literally miles of wire. So this new connector, um, can you tell us any details about it in terms of how it improves over its pre predecessors? Yeah, so it, it it uses the tried and true method of of how we do interconnects from, above, uh, from the outside to the inside, mm. like I was talking about with the landing gear, speaking to the cockpit. And um, so it's got the same type of performance there from a harsh environment, high vibration, high shock capabilities, mm. negative 55 degrees C to plus 200 degrees C That's for temperature. Hot. Yeah. So Continuous. very cold to very hot. Yeah. Can, it, can, it can live in that environment for years. Uh, 200 degrees? Yeah. Celsius. Yeah. What's it made of? Oh, it's aluminum with, this, with uh, various different types of platings and finishes for the conductivity of the product. But it's aluminum and it, it can last. Uh, and I'm assuming it's got some... I mean, I assume it's got insulated materials in yeah, there. So, so, so what are they made of? Uh, just special. Not, nothing Spe special. special <laughs> no, nothing uh, nothing all not too special. Nothing too special. From the epoxies of right. the plastic or the elastomers of the rubber seals that are used for the harsh environment to keep but the you, connectors. But, you, but you're using rubber in a 200 degree environment. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Sil silicone or fluorosilicone. Bloody hell. We'll get you there. I'm bloody shocked yeah. actually. It's 200 degrees. Yeah. But, you know, you think of the jacket of the cable, too. Mm, you know, yeah. the PTFE or some of the other type of oh, jacket of true, materials, yeah. right? Mm. And they, they have to live there, too. Mm. Minus 55 to plus 200 is very standard for aerospace, defense, space, mm, of course. which is another market we love yeah. to talk about is the space market. Oh, absolutely. But anyways, this MD product family of ours is, again, to shrink the package, higher density, better, you know, equal performance from a harsh environment, negative 55 to 200 over a thousand mating cycles. The configurations are tremendous. We have several configurations mm -hmm. that when you have a different type of plug and receptacle mating to each other, different platings, you can do different, um, you can have, what we'll call them keyways or key oh, yeah, yeah. So you can, positions so yeah, you yeah. don't mismate them. Yeah. If you put a bunch of them next to each other on a box, those type of things. And you can literally make about 10,000 part numbers from just having this small group of products that you offer mm. and these configurations, because again, the different, all, the plating, so you want more conductivity for your plating, great, you've got that there. You want Rojas compliance with your plating, we got that. If you want more corrosion resistance for your plating, we've got that. Um, if you want a configuration with just two or three contacts in it, we've got that. If you want uh, 120 contacts, so really high dense configuration, so you got a lot of wires going in there. Mm. You can do that as well. Uh, and so everything in between as well. Um, and one thing I want to pick up on, because you mentioned space, um, what, would you, what would you say is the, what is the most challenging application you've seen for your products uh, so far? Good question. I think, uh, you know, we've talked about a few and obviously munitions is one of them for yeah. sure. Um, those, those get to be. The thing with munitions, though, even though the criticality of it is so important that mm. they get this thing spot on, it's a one and done application. It's a one and? One and done. Oh, yeah. Right? You shoot it once, <laughs> it goes, it does its You don't pick it up and reuse it. Right. You get to an aircraft, especially a commercial aircraft, mm. carrying 500 passengers one side of the world to the next side of the world. That's got to get up and down many, many times. Yeah. And the same goes even though, you know, some of the, some of the uh, space people out there are retrieving retrieving parts of the things oh. that they're sending up. So now they don't have to just survive going up, they've got to survive coming back down now. That too, mm. and that's there. But still, I think that that most tricky part is building it for something. You know, these aircraft go for 40 years or yeah. longer. And there's connectors. I can show you date codes on connectors that were 
may be replaced once in that time. And these things are 30 years sitting, on, sitting in application and working. Now, my, my instinct is to firstly say, bloody hell, bloody hell, I hope that's not on my plane. Right. But having said that, if it's been working for 30 years, don't touch it because it clearly it. works. Right. And so, and so, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've, I've always been a bit critical. Of, and you know, I'm always going to, I'm always going to keep bashing Elon Musk here. I always, I always don't like the fact that when I saw the the the, the interior of this of the SpaceX um, um, pods, you had all these touch screens and all these great looking beautiful things. But the thing is, the reason why NASA still uses cogs, wheels, and bloody levers is because it works. They've proven it for the past hundred years. It it's proven itself time and time again. Uh, the same with the Russian Russian equipment, like the um, oh, what's that? What's the one thing? Uh, the Soyuz. They it, the technology is like sixty years, seventy years old, but you know it's going to work. It's going to go up. It's going to come down. It's going to keep you alive. Yeah. And so, like you say, with the planes, the connectors might be fifty years old, forty years old, but they have proven themselves over that period of time, and so that's why they're still valid. Um, now, on this topic of space, very quickly, um, how would you say that do cables suffer uh, sorry do connectors uh suffer issues when it comes to things like the large temperature differences you get when one side is facing the sun the other one's facing the vacuum of space well and that that goes with uh the fact that you have to have that range mm. so and and when you get to space negative 65 c uh to plus 260 c mm. you start to see a little bit wider range which we have the products for that as well yeah uh, but when you get into really really um uh, interesting atmospheres in space that you're going to be there for a really long time without protection, mm. then you need to start getting, thinking of the cryogenics of things, right? Of course. And so that's a whole nother world. And there's some evolution that we're breaking into there, especially on the quantum computing side of things. Mm. And we know that we need to upgrade our materials so that we can get there. But in space, what we've seen so far in space, where we play in the performance requirements of general aircraft, military aircraft, missiles, and those type of things, we seem to, we seem to be okay. Hmm. So they haven't gotten to the point where they said, okay, we need you to live outside the space station, hmm. unprotected, and sitting in this environment for many, many years. Hmm. You know, satellites go up, but most of the interconnects are pretty well, or at least somewhat contained and protected yeah. from shields and those with shields and those type of things. So you don't you you'll see temperature and, and, variation, but not that extreme. And, and you can keep it warm inside the craft by by using heaters, so to make sure. And, and you can spin the craft, so it's got uh, what you call it, averaged heating across the whole exactly. thing. So just before we finish up this interview, I've got one more question for you. Uh, for the audiences out there watching this video, if they want to get into these new products and the ones that you offer, what would you recommend they do? Well, I think a great place to go is our uh, parent website, which is bellfuse.com. Mm -hmm. And within bellfuse.com, you'll be able to find Cinch Connectivity Solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's a mantra of products or products, uh, brochures. We have a resource tab with brochures. We have market brochures, product brochures, everything you can think of. Um, and also you can dig into each product line that we have, all the different technologies that we offer. And we offer from RF, high frequency, because I know we wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the some of the newer stuff we have, but RF mm. RF high frequency, we have optical technology, and we have your traditional power and signal products, and so um, you can find all that right there at bellfuse.com and find the Cinch Connectivity Solutions page, and all everything's there right Fantastic. at your fingertip. Well, thank you ever so much for taking the time today, Robin. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it.